if if things really did blow up, there just aren't enough courts and lawyers to be, even begin to figure out how to unravel that whole thing. Because I think this is what the actual legal code looks like now. This is my artist's rendition of it. So there's really a couple of ways that this could go. So let's imagine for a minute that there's another financial crisis. I know, I know, I know, I know. Janet Yellen said there will never be one in anybody's lifetime. Not in my lifetime, right? Um, but there will be another financial crisis and it'll be pretty bad. And, and I, I'll show you some possible triggers for that. And then, so what would happen under that circumstance, right? So this is the whole point of the great taking. We're worried that what happens next is all those sharks in Wall Street go, well, so sorry for your luck, but all your stocks and bonds are our collateral because our bets are really important. If we, if our bets don't get settled, the system might become unstable. <laughs> it's just, it's so stupid and self-serving and ridiculous. I'm like, good, let's have an unstable system. Dust settles. We've lost all of our major banks. I'm like, fine. I don't care. I actually am kind of happy about that. So yeah, I, <laughs> rip the bandaid off, get rid of these stupid companies that can't survive without constant bailouts and larger, larger interventions and in my stocks and bonds. Right. All right. So during the next financial crisis, there are only two paths here we got to worry about, I think, really. Um, here's one. Uh, first things first, um, Congress gets delivered a very expensive memo. Remember Hank Paulson's memo? Two pages, well, not even two, like one and three quarters pages. And he said, I need $780 billion or it'll be martial law and frogs coming out of the sky. You know, it's like he, he had this whole dire apocalyptic thing and he scared the bejesus out of Congress and Congress ponied up 780 billion, which wasn't even close to enough. Um, and, and all of that. And you're asking, well, wait a minute. If, if contracts like these derivatives have to net out and they have a zero sum. So one person's gain is another person's loss. And we coughed up 780 billion taxpayer dollars right out of the gate to begin to patch those holes. That means that the 780 billion on the other side of those losing contracts, the winning side, they kept their winnings. We just patched in the losses. Really? Well, did we claw back five years of, of remittances or remuneration for all the people who were in that entire industry? That's how I would do it. I would say, okay, listen, Wall Street, here's a trillion dollars. You need that right now. But we're going to reach back into everybody who was working on Wall Street during the last five years, whether they are today or not. And we're going to claw back 50% of their salary during that entire period of time, including all bonuses. Don't do that again next time, right? So without that, without without any sort of consequence for Wall Street, of course it's going to keep doing this. It's called moral hazard. When you make something more likely because you are protecting people from the downside, you create a moral hazard. It is more likely that that thing is going to happen in the future, not less likely. Hey, Wall Street took too many risks. We'll bail you out. Don't do it again. Wall Street's lesson is, I guess if I'm going to do this, I should take big risks or bigger risks. I want to make sure I'm too big to jail, too big to fail. And that's how it goes. So it's really bizarre that we're here. So step, you know, path one, Congress has to bail out. Now this could be, so what was it? 800, almost 900 billion to bail out from Federal Reserve on that first great financial crisis. Then the repo madness of 2019 plus COVID was four and a half, almost five trillion. Um, this next one will be an order of magnitude larger than that. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 trillion, something like that. That's what we're talking about, which is going to be bad. Now, the alternative to that is you would have to litigate every one of these 546E claims, and, and it would just be this giant, nearly endless series of court battles that stretches out for decades. There aren't enough litigators there aren't enough courtrooms. There aren't enough judges with experience. There's none of that. So that would be, that would take decades. And meanwhile, everything would be frozen and broken and full of recriminations. So obviously that is a path, but it's not very likely. Nobody's going to take that path. All right. Now I want to talk about uh, how we begin to connect. What, what is the pin for this particular grenade? And then we're going to get into the EQRP stuff. So I wrote this a decade ago, talking about um, how there was this sort of floor and ceiling price. It was this relationship between oil supply and the economy. And I said, one reasonable prediction of how the economy and oil prices might respond to peak oil can be described as an undulating plateau. Under this scenario, a heated economy would encounter crimped supplies of oil, leading to dramatic price hikes, 
which would then cause the economy to contract. And this would be the first cycle of the undulating plateau. And on the next leg up, the economy, and by the way, when the economy contracts, the price of oil plummets again. And But on the next leg up, the economy would, would benefit from lower oil prices, dust itself off, get going again. But this time with less total capacity because, you know, there's as much oil capacity out there as there was before. And due to the natural decline rates in existing fields, coupled to a lack of investment in new fields, this is where we are today. Yeah, I'm, I'm, almost, I'm always early to these things. I didn't know shale oil was going to be quite the thing it turned out to be. But even if it hadn't been, I was still going to be early for other reasons. So that would be the name of my new podcast, Unfashionably Early. Like, the party isn't for an hour, Chris. What are you doing here? You know, that's, just, that's me, I guess. Uh, I've mocked up this behavior in this representative chart. And so the oil supply is in red. The economy is in blue. So the economy goes up and oil supply follows along because prices are rising. But then, oops, you know, the oil price gets a little bit too high and uh, the economy collapses. So the supply comes back down and we go do, 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 do. We sort of bump down that uh, plateau. As I carried on, I said, because there's less oil in each succeeding leg of the cycle, the economy cannot attain its prior actual heights, although we'll print and pretend as if it's there. The energy simply isn't there. So you'll note in the chart above that the economy re rebounds to a lesser and lesser and lesser height each leg of the cycle. And But even as ec economic activity is tripping down a stairwell, oil prices will be doing the opposite. So here we'll see oil supplies and prices. So um, as oil prices spike upwards in black, you see the red starts to climb, but then oil, price, oil prices plummet because the economy is taken a dump and then oops oil supply sort of ticks down but then oil prices spike up again and then we get a little yeah we get a rebound because you know more expensive oil gives you more discoveries and on and on and on and i think we'll see these wild gyrations and those oil price swings can be expected to grow larger and more volatile as time progresses and at the end we might expect the price of oil to finally match its value which i peg at around 500 hours of human labor now i would bring that up because Luke Groman and I just had a very, very nice discussion. I thought it was another excellent, excellent podcast. I'm very happy with it. He sent out a slide deck uh, for me to look at. And he said, well, you know, here's, and well, for every, he's, it's for his subscribers too. And you should consider subscribing. Uh, Forest for the Trees, FFTT slash LLC.com. That's his site. So he has a subscription service there. And, and his hypothesis is that we're now accelerating toward the intersection of two lines. Line one on top is the price of oil that will blow up debt markets due to stagflationary impulses um, as, as debt levels rise. So that black line is falling because the price of oil that you can sustain as your amount of debt is skyrocketing, even exponentially going higher, the price actually falls lower and lower. So on higher debt loads, you can afford a lower price of oil and vice versa. So that's why the price of oil, <clears throat> the price that the bond market can sustain is slowly drifting down over time. The red line on the bottom is the price of oil needed to prevent supply shortfalls that will also blow up the debt markets. And that's rising because of peak cheap oil. So we're out of the cheap stuff. There is more oil. It's not as cheap. It's more expensive. And Doomberg notwithstanding, this is the reality. Talk to anybody out there in the space and it's pretty real. So his point is that, that you have this price of oil that, that blows up the debt markets falling because debt markets are, you know, skying higher exponentially. And then on the, under that, you have this red line, which is, well, the price of oil that needs to keep rising so we can have more supplies. It's not even the same as supplies. We need more supplies because we have more debt and we need more economic activity and economic activity is connected to oil supplies. So at any rate, when those two lines cross, though, that's where it's kind of like game over game over for the system where there's no right price of oil anymore. And now you're going to have to get into other schemes to try and keep the whole thing from not completely imploding. And those schemes would include lots of printing, protecting the bond markets by buying up lots of bonds officially. The Federal Reserve balance sheet expands. They revalue gold to some crazy amount and pass all that money over to the treasury, whatever. Printing, printing, printing. So uh, what I loved about talking with Luke, though, is that he's able to connect energy and the economy. There's so few people who can do that still. It's bizarre to me, but he's one of them. And I really enjoy that he is able to do that. 
And so he says here, his conclusion to all these slides he, he had on this thing was the first global sovereign debt bubble in 100 years needs low and stable inflation and stable energy prices. Those are connected concepts and rising oil supplies to be sustained. So this is the first sovereign global debt bubble. We've had sovereign debt bubbles before in countries. This is global. So there's no escaping it, right? It's, it's everywhere. And it needs rising oil supplies just to be sustained. Like if we want more debt in the future, and that's just the system and how it is, we're going to need more oil supplies. He carries on. Peak cheap oil is fundamentally incompatible with global sovereign debt bubble as growing oil supplies require either sustained oil inflation or a weaker U.S. dollar, both of which are inflationary, right? Because sustained oil inflation means the price of oil is going up. That bleeds into everything because oil is a, a, a derivative input cost for everything, pretty much. Um, and so sustained oil inflation is inflationary, or you got to drive a weaker U.S. dollar, which makes everything go up, including the price of oil. Um, while low oil prices require a recession, which is deflationary, or significant investment, which is inflationary. With sovereign debt GDP this high, either or both, inflation or recession, are highly problematic for global debt markets. Global debt markets ain't going to like recession. They really don't like high inflation. They need everything not to have be that way, but that's where we are, and it's because we're in this floor and ceiling vice. We're getting caught. You can feel those things coming together. Is this why people are waking up at 3.30 and feeling really weird and awkward? I think so. I think it's part of the explanation set. So as Ludwig von Mises said, there is no means of avoiding the final collapse of a boom brought about by credit expansion. The alternative is only whether the crisis should come sooner as the result of a voluntary abandonment of further credit expansion or later as a final and total catastrophe of the currency system involved. Voluntary abandonment, path one. Well, that means, what's voluntary abandonment? We would also call that um, austerity. That would mean Congress coming out and going, we can't send money to Ukraine. In fact, we're going to have to raise taxes and cut spending in order to bring our debt levels down. And we're going to have to really um, lean on the Federal Reserve and we're going to have to raise interest rates so that households go into debt less begin paying that off so the corporations pay off their debts, etc. That's never going to happen. That is a career killer, life-changing, never get elected again, get run out of your office with your effigy burned on the Washington Mall as a Federal Reserve chairman, which only happened to Paul Volcker. He's the only Federal Reserve chairman ever to be burned in effigy, which is why I think he was a good guy. Um, because uh, he, he did what he had to do to pull that about. But there is no means of avoiding that final collapse. Ludwig von Mises, famous Austrian economist, he's absolutely right about this. This is where we are. We are in the end stages of a violent super bubble in credit. It's global. And in order for it to persist and maintain, we need rising oil supplies. Kind of price independent, but he's got some flavor on there that the prices matter too. But we need rising oil supplies, full stop. Because of course, as you know, being a follower of mine, that on that chart of oil and GDP, it is a straight line. The more oil a country burns, the more GDP they have. The GDP is the nominal excuse or rationale for why you could support all this debt level out there. And in fact, provides the payments, the interest payments, in order to um, satisfy and service those debts. So that's where we are. That's where we are. We're here. These two lines are coming closer together. Where is that magic crossing point? Don't know. Um... But he calls that, that's going to be the third oil crisis because we had two others in the past. He calls this the third one. It's a tipping point. And um, yeah, so in, yep. Let you read that some other time. All right. So a lot of what I do, what, what Peak Prosperity does in my team, we care a lot about financial freedom. And we want to help people get to financial freedom. And it's a very complicated topic. It involves things like passive income and saving money and managing money and having plans and reducing expenses and making investments and simplifying our lives and all of that and eliminating debt, getting more cash flows. It's really important to me because one of the things that really bothered me, and I, I, I was really upset hearing about people, some of them, our own tribe members here at Peak Prosperity saying, I really, I didn't have a choice about getting the shot. If 
I didn't get the magic holy shot, I didn't want it, but I was going to lose my job. That's a lack of financial freedom when you're put in that position where, you, you know, and I get it, right? You've trained, you're an engineer, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're a specialist, you're something. You put all your life into this career. You've gotten a college degree. You've done everything you're supposed to do. And then they up and pull the rug out and change the rules on you. Say, oh yeah, you can only keep your job if you get, get a shot, right? That's horrifying to me. Well, as horrifying as it was under COVID, I'm convinced that we're going to see many more of these um, economic events coming. I want to, if I could, I would be running around with my hair on fire, warning people that what I see coming in the financial markets in the next, certainly by 2030, but it's bearing down on us. And I can't guarantee it won't start tonight at 830. Who knows? But it's, it's solved in large measure or it's, or it's buffered by having financial freedom. For me, financial freedom means having multiple sources of income, right? It's got some bonds paying off, you know, interest at Treasury Direct got a business that's got some cash flows, have the ability to earn some side money doing something else. Whatever those things are, you have multiple streams of income. And if you have that and one of those streams dries up or dies, well, you got the other ones at least. It creates that buffer. But having having your wealth is one thing, but you got now we got to worry about it's not enough to have earned it and saved it. You know that the Federal Reserve is actively trying to destroy the value of your hard work and your savings. They're telling you straight up. They're like, oh, we want it 2%. Every 35 years, we want half the value of your money in our hot little hands if you don't play along. And if you play along, oops, your money ends up in the hands of Wall Street. I mean, it's just such a rigged game. They force you to play and then they punish you for playing. It's a bizarre thing. So, so what can we do about that? Well, we have Peak Financial Investing, which is a, a related sister company of ours. Uh, and this is a registered investment advisory. And we use Peak Financial Investing as the legal means to direct people to such awesome places as Kiker Wealth Management. So for people who want to have their money managed, it's great. I think Paul does absolutely the best job that I've seen so far out of any financial advisor I've talked to of looking at the great taking, understanding what it means, and then wrestling with what to do about it. And he's working really diligently. It's complicated, as you might imagine. He's got a lot of legal permutations. He's got a, a lawyer in, engaged. Uh, we're, we're looking at systems. He's doing all kinds of great stuff. But more than that, he actually cares about his his clients. And he he understands and takes it very seriously that he has a fiduciary responsibility to his clients. It's his job not to lose all their money accidentally because he didn't pay attention. Like if you're notified about the great taking and then you do this, you're not doing your job as far as I'm concerned. So Paul, Paul's up on that. And I love that as well. We think you should hold gold and silver should be in your hot little hands, to be honest, you know, but if you want to have some vaulted as well, we get that. So gold core, um, you can buy gold and silver directly from them and have it shipped to you, or you can have it vaulted as well. Hard asset Alliance will also perform both of those services. Everybody though, really ought to have some gold and silver in their hot little hands and any other hard assets that float your boat, right? farmland, um, productive enterprises, real estate. I'm a big fan of all of that. But we have one more to add to this mix as we broaden out our discussion. A lot of you asked me questions about, well, what do I do with my 401k, with my IRA, with my retirement plan? So let's talk about that very quickly. EQRP, it's an enhanced qualified retirement plan. There's different types of retirement plans out there, qualified retirement plans. There's a whole list of those. This is an enhanced qualified retirement plan that's offered through Damian Lupo's company, eqrp.com. And we're going to hear from Damian in just a second, because I'm going to bring him on and interview him. And, um, you know, here's what you get when you roll over your 401, your IRA, your, your Sidra, your 403B, 457 TSP, solo 401ks into an eqrp account. One, you get freedom for you and your employees, if you have employees, to choose your investments. That's why I have one. Invest in real assets, such as cryptocurrency, real estate, physical gold, and silver. You can save on taxes, defer up to 67500 this year in income, or up to 135000 as a couple, and access to a community of 3,000 like-minded investors, because they've got a big community of people working on this. So... At any rate, let's turn now, let's hear from Damien and we'll wrap this up, but I'd want to tell you about the EQRP. And by the way, of course, we have special deals here for you, uh, our subscribers, because 
uh, any chance we can, that's what we do. So I'm just trying to help you uh, get the get the most financial freedom as you can, help you figure out solutions to this. But the EQRP is actually one of the threads that I use to help me have more access to hard assets in my retirement account. And that's important to me. All right, let's turn now to my interview with Damien. 